Please be seated. As you heard me mention at the beginning, it's my great delight this morning to welcome my friend, Dr. Paul Gordon Chandler, to the Riverside pulpit this morning. Dr. Chandler, welcome. Good morning. It's a real privilege to be here with you this morning. And on behalf of the 40 artists uh, that actually are represented around you, Middle Eastern and Western premier contemporary artists, I bring you their greetings as well. They come from all over the Middle East. And the majority, interestingly, are of Muslim background, which I think is quite symbolic and very representative of the inclusive nature of this church. And I give you thanks for that. Let's begin with a moment of prayer. And in the Middle East, we always stand when we pray, so I'm going to ask you to stand again. We stand out of reverence for whom we're speaking to. Let us pray. Almighty God, this morning we open our sails into the winds of your spirit. Take us, dear God, to those places we need to go where you await us. Amen. You may be seated. For generations, children in churches in North America have loved our gospel reading about Zacchaeus by acting the story out and singing about him. This little man who climbs the tree to see Jesus walking by gives us one of the most vivid children's stories we find in the scriptures. Many of us who actually grew up in church will remember that classic children's song about Zacchaeus that we would sing. It went like this, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in that sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in that tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today for I'm going to your house today. Now, of course, it has all kinds of hand motions, which I will spare you this morning. However, the almost comic tone of the story and its happy Disney-like ending shouldn't be allowed to disguise the depth of what can be learned through it, and especially at the present time. Luke, a non-Jew, is the only gospel writer to give us this story and he makes Zacchaeus one of his heroes. There's a sense here that Luke, in writing this, is telling this story as a kind of final piece of framing before Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time. It's almost a summing up of all that Jesus has been about. It's almost like he's saying, look, this is God's way of working. As we're all aware today, there's this increasing chasm of discord and misunderstanding that exists between the Middle East and the West, and certainly between their creeds and cultures. This even led in some circles to, as we all know, an Islamophobia. Hence, it's more critical than ever, I think, that creative demonstrations of dialogue take place, which is really what this reading is all about. A reading says a man was there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see Jesus, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. Every imaginable barrier is up, keeping them apart. Social, cultural, economical, religious, and even physical in this instance. Socially, Luke takes great care to emphasize that he was the chief tax collector and that he was rich. At that time, Jericho was a very prosperous town, a key trading crossroads. Its dates and balsam wood were exported around the world. It's also one of the greatest taxation centers at that time in Palestine. So for Zacchaeus to be the chief tax collector, that would mean he was extremely wealthy. And as chief tax collector, he would have been also the most hated person in the area, as tax collecting was considered a very dishonorable profession. Tax collectors worked with their occupiers, the Romans, and enriched themselves by cheating their own people. So his wealth was really everyone else's money. Incidentally, this is the only time this title, chief tax collector, is used in the scriptures, 
So Luke is emphasizing how socially alienated Zacchaeus would be. And religiously, they were separated as well, for at that time, Zacchaeus was viewed as one of the greatest sinners, those who most displeased God. Tax collectors were so despised that they were barred from the temple. And as a result, in the crowd that day, he would have been nudged and elbowed and kicked. It would have been a day of bruises. Certainly, no one would make room for him in the crowd. And physically here, he was short, therefore he couldn't see over the crowds. But in other words here, every conceivable wall existed to prevent them from really knowing each other. In fact, this is the symbolism that the story takes place in Jericho. As you may recall the Hebrew story, the one where all the Jewish people at that time knew very well of how the Hebrews felled the walls of Jericho. Our reading goes on to say, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And passing by, Jesus stops and he looks up at Zacchaeus. The moment of the eye, their eyes met is worthy of an operatic aria. Jesus stops and says, what? I must stay at your house. Not I would like to stay. It's a strong expression here meaning not only visiting him, but fully being Zacchaeus' guest. So in effect, Jesus is saying, Zacchaeus, I want to be your guest. And as he went to Zacchaeus' home, our reading tells us that he was criticized for being the guest of such a despised person. In the Middle East, we hear, where I spent most of my life, we hear a lot about the famous Arab hospitality and how important it is for us to in turn demonstrate that. I would suggest that it's much more important still for us to exhibit the guest posture. Not working to be a host, but focusing on what it means to be a guest. Because when we're the guest of someone, we've submitted to them. We've put ourselves at their disposal. We've put ourselves in a state of vulnerability and humility. The fundamental characteristic of being a guest is that you're actually willing to receive from the host. I believe we need to, in effect, allow ourselves to be the guest of our Muslim brothers and sisters today, allowing ourselves actually to learn from them. It is a posture that breaks down the barriers. In the Middle East, there's this wonderful Arab proverb, the guest is a guest of God. Rumi, the poet, used to love to say that this being human is a guest house. And this guest posture is very much Jesus' approach to breaking down the barriers. And we're reminded of how Jesus related to the Samaritans, actually, of his day, who you could call the Muslims of Christ's day. The Samaritans shared the same religious story as the Jews. They had the same prophets, the same holy places, but they had differing interpretations. And yet Jesus refused to wage any tension on them whatsoever. In fact, in his stories, he always makes them the heroes. At his sacred encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus responds to her spiritual thirst, do you remember? And he gives us one of the most beautiful stories of grace and love found in the Gospels. Jesus asked her for a drink, an unthinkable thing for a Jew to do then, speaking to her out of his need, actually, and out of respect. And it resulted in her asking him, how is it? How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Samaria. How is it? Mazhar Maluhi, the noted Syrian novelist, has a beautiful way of describing this encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman as this. As two thirsty people that day at a sacred well who meet and journey together. What we need to do more than anything else is to ask the other, whoever that other is, can I be your guest? And the example of Jesus here is exemplary in demonstrating the guest posture. We're told that Jesus, when he stopped, he looked up and he took the initiative. There's never been a time when the need has perhaps been greater to proactively wage peace on the other, especially in regard to our Muslim brothers and sisters. And I believe we need to be involved in an all-out effort to help them, not conquer them. 
with goodwill and appreciation and love and sympathy and empathy with all they're going through and prayer and eliminate everything that creates any further alienation advocating a peaceful approach one that is entirely non-confrontational in nature I love the experience of St. Francis of Assisi in 1219 during the height of the Crusades when he came to Egypt to meet the great Sultan Kamal, the nephew of the great Islamic leader Salah Hadin. And Francis comes in peace and humility. The Sultan is fighting the Crusaders on another front and he's never seen a Christian like this before. And he invites him in and they stay together for three days. And then when Francis leaves, he invites Francis to send his little brothers, his missionaries, all throughout his lands during the Crusades. And St. Francis went back to Italy and he wrote those marvelous words, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. It comes out of an Islamic context. Jesus also right from the beginning interacts with Zacchaeus around the commonalities that they have. First on a very basic level around food, a meal, something both share in common, something very important, as you may know, in the Middle East, and of course also very good, delicious. But secondly, on a spiritual level, he refers to Zacchaeus as a son of Abraham, in effect saying we are all in the same family. It was symbolic language at that time for being a full beneficiary of God's grace even though the Jewish religious society at that time would have excluded Zacchaeus. And with the widening divide that exists today, I think our day calls for a whole new kind of movement, not of belief, not of religious unity, but one that builds on what we hold in common. Like never before, we need to primarily have as our focus building on all of the commonalities that exist between Christians and Muslims. The way I like to say it is we need to build on the dark side of the moon. The Islamic symbol of faith, of course, is the crescent, which we can see because of the reflection. But when we see that crescent, the majority of the moon, of course, is dark. And for the sake of an illustration, I would say that slim crescent is actually what we have different from our Muslim brothers and sisters, and the dark side is what we have in common. And the challenge for us, like never before, is to build our relationships with the other on the dark side of the moon, a la Pink Floyd. Do you remember Pink Floyd had that? We're too often blinded by the constant illumination of our differences, the crescent, that we can't see all that we have in common. It's the early 20th century Lebanese artist and writer and mystic Halil Gibran of Christian background profoundly, uh, who profoundly bridged east and west said, your neighbor is actually your other self dwelling behind a wall and understanding all walls shall fall down. And building on all of the commonalities and similarities from the traditions and the liturgical and worship practices to so much of the theology, monotheism, yes, one God, the God of Abraham, but also the creator God, however one sees that. The authority and the respect of they place in Moses and all of the Hebrew prophets, their des- desire to fulfill God's goals of justice and mercy, understanding life as sacred as we do, and certainly building on their mutual our mutual respect for Jesus. Having spent most of my life within the Islamic world, I would have to say that no others from a non-Christian religion have devoted so much attention to Jesus as our Muslim brothers and sisters. As the renowned professor Tarif Khalidi, a Muslim formerly of Cambridge University, now at the American University in Beirut, who wrote that marvelous book, The Muslim Jesus, says this, For Muslims, there exists a preoccupation with Jesus that is unique among the world's non-Christian religions. Islamic culture presents us with what in quantity and quality are the richest images of Jesus in any non-Christian culture. No other world religion known to to me has devoted so much loving attention to both the Jesus of history and the Christ of eternity. That's a Muslim writing that. And Sufis, the mystics within Islam, are particularly sympathetic to Jesus, or Isa as they call him, calling him a prophet of the heart. It's been said of Ibn al-Arabi, the 13th century Sufi mystic, 
that he is actually a man for this time because he has his foot in every camp, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish. And it was Ibn al-Arabi who said, the person who catches the disease of Christ cannot be cured. I like that. And it's crucial that Western Christians remember as well that our faith is actually not a Western-oriented faith, but a Middle Eastern faith in origin. And when this is forgotten, our true sense of identity is lost of who we really are and where we came from. It's only due to an accident of history that the center of gravity of Christianity moved to the West. We both come from the Middle East. And when we Christians think of the Quran, the uh, Islamic holy book, we think of it, of course, as a Middle Eastern sacred text, the sacred text of Islam. And yet the Christian scriptures, what we call the Bible, collection is really a collection of ancient Middle Eastern books put into one volume for us to be able to carry around. In fact, the Christian scriptures are more Middle Eastern in their complexity than the Quran. They're written in three Middle Eastern languages, not one. They're rooted in Middle Eastern culture, deeply rooted, and they're more culturally steeped in the ancient Middle East than even the Quran. And it's critical for Christians to recognize and emphasize the Middle Eastern origin of our faith when we relate especially to our Muslim brothers and sisters. Removing all the Western cultural and religious trappings associated with our faith as we both seek to follow the teachings of Jesus who first walked the Middle Eastern road. It's essential that we build our relationships on the commonalities, which is what this exhibition is all about, the key. Using the world's oldest, most ancient symbol of harmony, the Egyptian Ankh, often called the key of life. It echoes the words of Khalil Gibran when he wrote, I love you when you bow in your mosque and you kneel in your temple and pray in your church. For you and I are children really of one religion and it is the spirit. The essence of the guest posture is so beautifully and naturally illustrated for us within this gospel reading. And not only is this posture and approach to others one that helps break down the barriers or the walls, but it also so beautifully enhances our own faith. The beautiful thing in all of this is that in discovering what is good and true in traditions different than our own, we can actually come to a deeper dimension in our own spiritual life. And when we build on the truth in the other, we end up actually understanding our own faith's depth and heritage in a very much in a transformed way. Our gospel reading comes at the end, actually, of this long narrative that Luke had of Jesus' journey into Jerusalem. He's on a pilgrimage, Jesus is, to Jerusalem. And while we know very little about Zacchaeus' life after this story, the homilies of the second century bishop of Alexandria, Clement of Alexandria, tell us that he traveled extensively with Peter, and ended up as the bishop of Caesarea. There's even a legend that years later, Zacchaeus eventually took a special mission journey to Gaul or France. So we're reminded here of the whole theme of journeying, of pilgrimage, which is, of course, one of the pillars in the Islamic tradition. And related to our Muslim brothers and sisters, I think it's critical for us to see ourselves as first and foremost as pilgrims not having arrived, but also journeying toward God. Much of religion teaches us that we arrive. Certainly the creedal emphasis of our faith breeds a sense of finality to it, that we get the truth and then if we're good, we pass it on. But instead, I think it's much more accurate that we see ourselves as a people of pilgrimage. For a pilgrim is someone on the move, always journeying, and therefore more open to asking others for directions meeting new people, even asking the other for help on our journey of trying to live the life God desires us to live. It's a certain attitude or a spirit of openness, of willingness, of, of gentleness. However, we can grow in our faith regardless of what or where it comes from. I'm reminded of that beautiful statement related to all of this by St. Ambrose of Milan who baptized St. Augustine of Hippo who was from North Africa. All truth, no matter where it comes from, 
comes from God's Spirit. I recently watched one of the most profound films I have seen in years. It's a French film titled Far From Men. It takes place in North Africa, in southern Algeria in 1954, as the Algerian uprising against the French colonist begins. The story is about how the lives of two very different men, a French school teacher of Christian background played by Viggo Mortensen, and a Muslim Algerian accused of murder are thrown together by a world in turmoil. And they go on a pilgrimage together, albeit a forced one. The Algerian is put into the French man's care by the French authorities, and against his will, he's required to take this Muslim Algerian across the Atlas Mountains to an army post, turn him in to the French authorities there, so he would go on trial. Not only not knowing at first if the Algerian really did murder someone in his village, he actually discovers on the way that he actually did. But throughout this harrowing journey that they take, they come to really get to know each other. They share personal things about themselves. And as they develop a respect for each other, even a friendship, each is slowly changed in their inner person by the other. Their lives are profoundly enhanced. And it's beautiful. There's this powerful scene towards the end of the film as the Western teacher decides to send the Algerian Arab off into the desert for his freedom, releasing him as he knows his own people will actually kill him. And he sends him off into that vast Saharan desert with these simple and beautiful words that he says in Arabic. Trust in the Creator. He will be there for you. Give to Him and He will give to you. Ask him, and he will provide. This guest posture, one of receiving and learning from those different than ourselves, has profound ramifications, both for the host, the other, and for the guest, ourselves. And I close with a verse from that marvelous pilgrim psalm, or as our Muslim brothers and sisters call it, the Zabur, Psalm 84. It's a psalm that both Christians, Muslims, or actually Christians, Muslims, and Jews love. And right in the middle of that psalm, it says this. Blessed are those who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Amen.